In this presentation, we will take a look at the Book of Mormon, chapters 1 through 6. So this is Mormon's own writings. Up to this time, he's been abridging a large plate. But now we come to his own time period and his book. So Mormon, chapter one, verse, chapters 1 through 6. Let's take a look at an introduction to chapters 1 through 6. Having summarized accounts of the Lord's visit among the Nephites and the 200-year era of peace that followed, Mormon reported that, starting in the year 20, 201st year, pride, disunion, and wickedness took over. In the Book of Mormon, we read of events where he was an eyewitness. These events included the demise of the Nephite civilization. In Mormon 1-6, through 6, we can emphasize em empathize with Mormon sorrow over the destruction of his people, the destruction which came upon them because of the rejection of the Lord and his gospel. We can also resolve to avoid such calamity in our own lives. It is difficult to know whether at this point Mormon has finished the task of abridging all the records of his ancestors. We can only imagine how overwhelming such a project must have been considering the awkward manner in which the Nephites had to write and the difficulty of making metallic, metallic plates on which to write. At any rate, now he is ready to begin his own record and write the final haunting chapters in the saga of the Nephite nation. Adding his own account is extremely important because it serves as an epilogue and final witness to the rest of his abridgment. By carefully recounting the final hideous death struggles of his people, he verifies the awful and agonizing truths of the words of the holy prophets, whose prophecies he has carefully and thought thoroughly recorded. His account bears witness of the hopeless, hell-like state of a people who once knew an almost celestial existence and then, a generation or so later, rejected God in totality. In giving such an account, he also warns us of the literal nature of the great and terrible promises pronounced upon those who have the gospel of Jesus Christ, serve him, and prosper, reject him, and be damned. Mormon's account of the morbid state of his people is tragic, almost horrifying. Their sickening and barbaric behavior, however, was the consequence of an even greater tragedy, their loss of hope for salvation. Mormon sadly observed that the day of grace was passed with them, both temporally and spiritually. In Mormon's record, we get a glimpse of what life without a hope in Christ would be like. If we read between the lines, we can also come to know that Mormon was an incredible man. Not only was he entrusted with the responsibility of the plates and called to lead the Nephite armies to ten, at tender ages, but Mormon profoundly loved and cared about his unbelievably degenerate Nephite people. Even after he felt compelled to resign as their leader because of their refusal to repent, his compassion for them drew him back to help them, knowing he would lead them to their inevitable demise and probably die with them. Mormon was surrounded by gross iniquity and sorrow throughout his life, yet he remained as strong and valiant in righteousness as his people were dis depraved in their wickedness. When in his epistle he wrote to a summerona of faith, hope, and charity, he knew whereof he spoke. Let's now go to Mormon chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 1, I, Mormon. The prophet Joseph Smith taught the word Mormon means literally more good. In an overview of Mormon's life, President Gordon B. Hinckley referred to the meaning associated with Moroni's name, a name that has become a reference to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Quote, May I remind you for a moment of the greatness and of the goodness of this man, Mormon. He lived on this American continent in the 4th century after Christ. When Mormon was a boy of 10, the historian of the people, whose name was Amaron, described him as a sober child and quick to observe. Amron gave him a charge that when he reached the age of 24, he was to take custody of the records of the generations who had preceded him. The years that followed Moroni's childhood were years of terrible bloodshed for his nation, the result of a long and vicious and terrible war between those who were called Nephites and those who were called Lamanites. Mormon later became the leader of the armies of the Nephites and witnessed the carnage of his people, making it plain to them that their repeated defeats came because they forsook the Lord and he in turn abandoned them. 
He wrote to our generation with words of warning and pleading, proclaiming with eloquence his testimony of the resurrected Christ. He warned of calamities to come if we should forsake the ways of the Lord as his own people had done. Knowing that his own life would soon be brought to an end, as his enemies hunted the survivors, he pleaded for our generation to walk with faith, hope, and charity, declaring, Charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever, and whosoever is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with him. Such was the goodness and the strength and the power, the faith, the prophetic heart of the prophet leader, Mormon. End of President Hinckley's quote. Chapter 1, verse 2. Thou art a sober child. It should not be thought that Mormon was somber. Rather, he was sober, meaning he was thoughtful and serious-minded, mature beyond his chronological age. Undoubtedly, Mormon's soberness was as much spiritual as emotional. The things of the Lord were important to him even at such an early age, as evidenced by the visitation of the Lord to him. See verse 15. Chapter 1, verse 2, quick to observe. As a prophet historian, it was imperative that Mormon be observant. This phrase perhaps also implies that he was not only observant and possessed of a good memory, but also insightful, perceptive, and recognizing what should be recorded to warn and bless the latter-day readers. Following now is a list of the type of society Mormon grew up in. That Mormon remained committed to Christ and the cause of righteousness is a tribute to his character and shows that we are free to choose or who or what we follow, even if one is surrounded by wickedness. Chapter 2, verse 7. The land have become very populous with many buildings. Chapter 2, 8 through 12. War broke out between the Nephites and the Lamanites, where the Lamanites were beaten by the Nephites in that the Lamanites withdrew. Chapter 2, verse 13, 14, wickedness covered the whole land insomuch that the Lord withdrew the three translated Nephite disciples from among them. This was done because they, one, were holy and sanctified, a condition so completely incompatible with the wickedness of the Nephites that they could not remain. And two, they could not fulfill their mission to bring souls unto Christ and preach the gospel because the Nephites, through their wickedness, had closed their ears and hardened their hearts to such a ministry, which caused the removal of miracles, healings, gifts of the Spirit, and the Holy Ghost because of all the wickedness. Chapter 1, verse 15. Even though he was just a young man of 15 years, Mormon was filled with faith, and his life was one of righteousness to the point that he was privileged to see the resurrected Christ. At some point, too, he was privileged to see and know the three translated Nephites. Perhaps even greater than these visitations, Mormon grew. Mormon knew the goodness of Jesus by personally experiencing the blessings of the atonement through faith in Christ. He was born again, and being filled with the Spirit, had iniquity burned, as it were, from his soul. This spiritual transformation from the natural man who is an enemy God to a new creature in Christ is the application of the goodness of Jesus. We also see, should seek to know. Thus we see that even in such a wicked society, one still has agency to choose whom he will follow. Chapter 2, verse 16, Willful Rebellion Against God Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles contrasted the spiritual maturity of Mormon with the sinful state of Mormon's people. In spite of Mormon's desire, righteous desires, he was forbidden to preach because of the rebellious condition of his people. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said, quote, The maturing Mormon, by then 15 years of age, stood beyond the sinfulness around him and rose above the despair of his time. Consequently, he was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus, trying valiantly to preach to his people. But as God occasionally does when those with so much light reject it, Mormon literally had his mouth shut. He was forbidden to preach to a nation that had willfully rebelled against their God. These people had rejected the miracles and messages delivered to them by the three translated Nephite disciples, who had now also been silenced in their ministry and been taken from the nation to whom they had been sent. End of quote. 
While serving as a member of the 70, Elder Dean L. Larson explained that rebellion against God has individual roots which, if not corrected, spread with devastating consequences. Quote, Historically, the drifting away from the course of life marked out by the Lord has occurred as individuals begin to make compromises with the Lord's standard. This is particularly true when the transgression is willful and no repentance occurs. Remember Mormon's description of those who had turned away from the true path in his day. They did not sin in ignorance. They willfully rebelled against God. It did not occur as a universal movement. It began as individual members of the church knowingly began to make compromises with the Lord's standard. They sought justification for their divisions in the knowledge that others were compromising as well. Those who willfully sin should seek to establish a standard of their own with which they can feel more comfortable and which justifies their misconduct. They also seek the association of those who are willing to drift with them along this path of self-delusion. As the number of the drifting individuals increased, their influence became more powerful. It might be described as the great and spacious building syndrome. The drifting is the most dangerous when its adherents continue to overly identify with and participate with the group that conforms to the Lord's way. Values and standards that were once clear became clouded and uncertain. The norm of behavior begins to reflect this beclouding of true principles. Conduct that would once have caused revulsion and alarm now becomes somewhat commonplace. End of quote. Chapter 1, verse 17. Because of the hardness of their hearts, the land was cursed for their sake. After the fall, the Lord declared unto Adam, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. It is clear from other scriptural commentary that this original cursing of the land as a result of the fall was a beneficial act that provided for the growth and development of Adam and Eve and their posterity, as well as allowing for the full operation of the plan of salvation. In contrast to this usage of the phrase, for their sake, Mormon used the phrase not to illustrate any beneficial aspects, but rather to point out another terrible consequence of the wickedness of his people. The definition of sake in the 1830 dictionary of some other contemporary edition would include on account of. This definition seems to fit better with Mormon's intent and it's con consistent with other Book of Mormon passages that use similar language. The land was cursed, not for the blessing or benefit of the Nephites in any way, but rather on account of their great wickedness. Chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. The return of the Gadiant and robbers infested the land, which made the keeping of material things impossible. The slippery earth did not necessarily swallow up treasures in some mystical or magical ways, but rather such treasures disappeared through the thievery and dishonesty of the Gadiantans and others with similar motives. Not only could they not hold and retain their earthly treasures because they were being stolen by others, but also they could not retain them in an eternal sense. Heart set on the tra transitory things of the world will be broken with a stark realization that the only real and lasting treasures are the riches of eternity. Also, the spirit of the devil prevailed as seen by their sorcery and witchcraft and magics. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency warned against intrigue with Satan's mysteries. It is not good practice to become intrigued by Satan and his mysteries. No good can, from, no good can come from getting close to evil. Like playing with fire, it is too easy to get burned. The only safe course is to keep well distance from him and any of his wicked activities or nefarious practices. The mischief of devil worship, sorcery, casting spells, witchcraft, voodooism, black magic, and all all other forms of demonism should be avoided like the plague. End of quote. Chap Mormon chapter 2, a continuation of Mormon society. Chapter 2, verse 1, war again between the Nephites and the Lamanites. Mormon, like his ancestor Nephi, was a large man physically and was also of a spiritual stature that was unique and impressive, especially for a teenager. Perhaps Mormon, like King Saul, was immediately looked to as the leader because of his impressive physical prowess. Undoubtedly, the other characteristics of spiritual immaturity, when coupled with his size, increased his stature among his peers. It could also be that he was a priesthood leader at a very young age, and as a result, people turned to him for leadership in both temporal and spiritual matters. 
President Joseph Fielding Smith observed, quote, We may conclude that Mormon received the priesthood at a very tender age. He was only ten years old when Amron counseled him and placed him placed in him the wonderful trust as guardian of the sacred plates. Moreover, when he was fifteen years of age, he had a visitation by the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. It appears that Mormon was appointed to lead the Nephite armies into battle against the Lamanites, not so much because of his physical stature, but more likely because he was intended, indeed a remarkable leader in many aspects of his life. We are left only to surmise all of the reasons why Mormon was thrust into weighty responsibilities while so young. The record does not detail all of the greatness and the unique qualifications of Mormon. Mormon, the record keeper, was, always, was also modest and humble. Chapter 2, verse 8. The entire land was embroiled in one complete revolution because of bloody conflicts with the Lamanites, as well as the havoc caused by the Gadianton robbers. The resulting bloodshed, chaos, and carnage was extensive, yet it still did not prompt the people to repent of their wickedness and to turn to the Lord for protection and peace. Chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Mormon records that his people began to repent. As seen in subsequent verses, they were not penitent at all. Mormon supposed that their mourning lamentations and deep sorrow were evidence of a desire to turn from their evil doings and come into faith to the Lord, who could deliver them both spiritually and temporally. This preliminary observation caused Mormon to rejoice in hopes that the Nephites would again become a righteous people. This hope, however, was in vain. Chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. The people did not sorrow because they had offended God and rebelled against him, but sorrowed because they could not take happiness in sin. Thus, this was the sorrowing of the damned. Instead of having a broken heart and contrite spirit, they cursed God and wished to die. This attitude of the wicked and unrepentant stands in, stands in direct opposition to that of those whose hearts are broken, whose spirits are contrite, and whose lives are filled with faith and hope in Christ. To the spiritually dead there is no desire to endure to the end, but instead a wish to die and supposedly end all their pain. They curse God, blaming him for their woes, rather than looking to God for life and pressing forward with steadfastness in Christ. Such a despondency is the antithesis of the faith and hope that fills the lives of the righteous who are faithfully endure, who faithfully endure to the end. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, noted the contrast between godly sorrow and the sorrowing of the dam. Quote, After recognition, real remorse floods the soul. That is a godly sorrow, not merely, not merely the sorrow of the world, nor the sorrowing of the dam when we can no longer take happiness in sin. False remorse instead of is like fondling our failings. In ritual regret, we mourn our mistakes, but without mending them. End of quote. In contrast to the sorrowing of the damned, President Ezra Tapp Benson explained the nature of godly sorrow so that we might understand the sorrow that leads to cleansing repentance. Quote, godly sorrow is a gift of the Spirit. It is a deep realization that our actions have offended our Father and our God. It is the sharp and keen awareness that our behavior caused the Savior, who knew no sin, even the greatest of all, to endure agony and suffering. Our sins caused him to bleed at every pore. This very real mental and spiritual anguish is what the scriptures refer to as having a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Such a spirit is the absolute prerequisite for true repentance. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse 15. Mormon saw that the day of grace was past with his people, both temporally and spiritually. For I saw thousands of them hewn down in open rebellion against their God, and heaped up as dung upon the face of the land. One of the greatest principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the principle of repentance, said President Harold B. Lee. However, if one has sinned so seriously and become habitually a sinner, the spirit of repentance leaves, and he may or may not be able to repent. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland noted the chilling line in Mormon's account that the time had run out for the saving 
his people, quote, it is as this moment in Nephite history, just under 950 years since it had begun, and just over 300 years since they had been visited by the Son of God himself, that Mormon realized the story was finished. In perhaps the most chilling line he ever wrote, Mormon asserted simply, I saw that the day of grace was passed with them, both temporally and spiritually. His people had learned that most faithful of all lessons, that the Spirit of God will not always strive with man, that it is possible collectively as well as individually to have time run out. The day of repentance can pass, and it had passed for the Nephites. Their numbers were being hewn down in open rebellion against their God, and in a metaphor almost too vivid in its moral commentary, they were being heaped up as dung upon the face of the land. End of quote. President Spencer W. Kimmel described how we today might also remove ourselves from the cleansing grace of repentance. Quote, it is true that the great principle of repentance is always available, but for the wicked and rebellious there are serious reservations to this statement. For instance, sin is intensely habit-forming and sometimes moves men to the tragic point of no return. As the transgressor moves deeper and deeper in his sin and the error is entrenched more deeply and the will to change is weakened, it becomes increasingly nearly hopeless and he skids down and down until either he does not want to climb back or he has lost the power to do so. End of quote. Chapter 2, verse 18, Mormon was constantly faced with a continual scene of wickedness and abomination before his eyes. Chapter 2, verse 19, in the midst of all this wickedness, Mormon had a sure knowledge that he will be lifted up at the last day. We are left to feel for Mormon and the difficulty of his life and ministry, as he so often was a lone voice of reason, unrighteousness. He can only read between, we can only read between the lines and wonder how he would remain faithful and righteous under such adverse conditions, and how he could maintain a personal hope when he was so often filled with sorrow and discouragement at the sins of his society. Implicit in this statement is the special spiritual blessing Mormon had received, which was an anchor to his soul amidst the turmoil and troubles of his life. It seems clear that he had obtained a more sure word of prophecy, the sure knowledge that he was sealed up to eternal life. This is linked with his having received the second comforter, the presence of the Savior. The prophet Joseph Smith often urged the saints to go on and continue to call upon God until you make your calling and election sure for yourselves by obtaining this more sure word of prophecy and wait patiently for the promise until you obtain it. One received these blessings only after, as Joseph taught, the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards. The realization that these blessings were his most assuredly kept Mormon from being overcome with sorrow or de debilitated with discouragement and also provided the spiritual strength he most needed to continue to succor and serve an unresponsive, unappreciated, hardened, and iniquitous people. The Book of Mormon provides accounts of other recipients of these great blessings and spiritual assurances. See Enos 127, Mosiah 26, 20, and 3 Nephi 28, 3. Chapter, 20, verse, chapter 2, verse 20, the Nephites become hunted and driven by the Lamanites. Chapter 2, verse 26, the Nephites did beat the Lamanites. Nevertheless, the strength of the Lord was not with us. Yea, we were left to ourselves, that the Spirit of the Lord did not abide in us. By using his own people as an example, Mormon provides us with a significant doctrinal teaching concerning the strength of the Lord that comes by the power of the Holy Ghost through personal righteousness. I know in the strength of the Lord that thou canst do all things, Lamoni testified. There is real power, both physical and spiritual, that can come into the life of every man or woman who is filled with the Holy Ghost. That power constitutes the strength of the Lord, a divine, unlimited power. Without that strength and power, we are left only with the limited mortal abilities of man. Mormon informs us that his people were without the Spirit, having no claim upon the infinite powers and strength of God. Being cut off from the blessings of the Spirit, they were left to their own natural abilities, which were infinitely inferior to the strength of the Lord. 
Thus, they were nothing special or unique. They were just like any other natural man. Ammon clearly understood the difference between the strength of the Lord and mortal man's weakness. He testified, I know that I am nothing as to my strength. I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself, but I will boast of my God, for in his strength I can do all things. Mormon chapter 3, again a continuation of Mormon society. Chapter 3, verses 2 through 3, Mormon was allowed by the Lord to call his people to repentance, but it was in vain. The people failed to recognize that the period of peace had, they had experienced had come to them, not because of their military might, but rather as a merciful blessing from God to give them an, appoint, an opportunity to repent. They didn't recognize that it was the Lord who had spared them. Thus, they hardened their hearts against the Lord. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. The war continued between the Nephites and the Lamanites with many slain. As the Lamanites began again to attack the Nephites and seek to take possession of their lands, Mormon's armies rallied their forces and were able to repel the Lamanites and secure a significant military victory. Rather than recognizing and delivering the, the delivering hand of God and praising him for their victory, the Nephites, blinded by their weakness, boasted in their own strength and glorified in their own and gloried in their own works. Elder Neil A. Maxwell cautioned us to recognize Heavenly Father's power instead of our own, quote, Before enjoying the harvest of righteous efforts, let us therefore first acknowledge God's hand. Otherwise, the rationalizations appear, and they include my power, and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Or we vaunt ourselves as ancient Israel would have done except for Gideon's deliberately small army, by boasting that mine own hand hath saved me. Touting our own hand makes it doubly hard to confess God's hand in all things. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 10, They did swear by the heavens and also by the throne of God. In the excitement and thrill surrounding their victory over the Lamanites, the Nephite armies not only boasted in their strength, but also began to swear oaths of vengeance against the Lamanites. Mormon was utterly offended by such actions because it was another evidence of their collective and individual spiritual emaciation. With this practice of oath swearing, they were blatantly regarding the commandments of the resurrected Jesus to their ancestors. It was not just this act of disobedience that repulsed Mormon and undoubtedly offended God, but that by using the name of Didi and swearing by the heavens, they were profaning and blaspheming God's sacred name. How hypocritical and profane to trample under the foot the commandments of God and the words of the holy prophets through willful rebellion and then swearing by sacred names and means to suit one's own carnal desires and wicked ambitions. This epitomizes one meaning of taking the name of God in vain. Chapter 3, verse 12. Mormon had led his people many times and loved them and prayed for them, but it was without faith. True faith requires some evident, degree of evidence for the things which are true or are hoped for. Mormon had prayed continually for his people. He had demonstrated great love for them and sorrowed in their sins and the bloodshed that prevailed. But his prayers in their behalf and his hopes for their repentance were without faith because there was no evidence of the things for which he had hoped. For while he continued to love them and hope for their reformation, it had been demonstrated to him time and time again, coupled with knowledge from the Spirit, that his beloved people had no desire to change, but rather desired to die physically, because they were already spirit dead spiritually. When he was in the presiding bishop, Bishop Glenn L. Pace admonished us to strive to emulate the love Mormon exhibited. Quote, this prophet had Christ-like love for a fallen people. Can we be content with loving less? We must press forward with the pure love of Christ to spread the good news of the gospel. As we do so and fight the war of, of good against evil, light against darkness, and truth against falsehood, we must not neglect our responsibilities of dressing the wounds of those who have fallen in battle. There is no room in the kingdom for fatalism. End of quote. Chapter 3, verse 14, the people had become so wicked that they had sworn by all that was forbidden by the Lord to avenge themselves of the blood of their brethren. 
I'm sorry, that should be... They had sworn. Chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Mormon takes a detour from describing a society and giving an explanation about the judgment of God. Elder Bruce R. McCarthy, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained that others would take part in our judgment. Quote, the reality is that there will be a whole hierarchy of judges who, under Christ, shall judge the righteous. He alone shall issue the decrees of damnation for the wicked. End of quote. The scriptures teach us that there will be at least five sources who will take part on Judgment Day. One, ourselves. Two, our bishops. Three, scriptures. Four, apostles. And five, Jesus Christ. President John Taylor further elaborated on the role of the apostles in our judgment. Quote, Christ is at the head. It would seem to be quite reasonable if the twelve apostles in Jerusalem are to be the judges of the twelve tribes, and the twelve disciples on this continent are to be the judges of the descendants of Nephi, that the brother of Jared and Jared should be the judges of the Jaredites, their descendants, and further that the first presidency in twelve who have officiated in our age should operate in regard to mankind in this dispensation. End of quote. Chapter Mormon chapter 4. 4 verse 1 through 5. War continues, and because the armies of the Nephites went up into the Lamanites, they began to be smitten. For were it not for that, the Lamanites could not have power over them. God's judgment will overtake the wicked, for it is by the wicked that the wicked are punished. Often, very often, we are punished as much by our sins as we are for our sins. As a boy K. Packer has written, Many of the destruction, plagues, and atrocities that come upon the world are a direct result of the wickedness of man. C.S. Lewis insightfully observed, The possibility of pain is inherent in the very existence of a world where souls can meet. When souls become wicked, they will certainly use this possibility to hurt one another, and this perhaps accounts for four-fifths of the suffering of men. It is men, not God, who have produced racks, whips, prisons, slavery, guns, bayonets, and bombs. It is by human avarice or human stupidity, not by the courteousness of nature, that we have poverty and overwork. End of quote. Chapter 4, verse 10, The Nephites repented not and continued in their wickedness continually. Chapter 4, verse 11, Their wickedness was so great that the people could not write the horrible carnage and bloodshed of the people. And because their hearts were so hardened that they delighted in the shedding of blood continually, the most extreme and abominable result of loving, of love waxing cold is not only can one shed innocent blood without repulsion, but also can actually receive pleasure in doing it. This was the case with the Nephites, and Mormon's account serves as a warning to us of the wickedness that will prevail in the last days, when men's hearts shall fail them, and the love of many shall wax cold. Delighting in bloodshed epitomizes the awful depths of to which a person or society can fall when they are spiritually past feeling. Chapter 4, verse 14 and 21. As the Lamanites marched against the Nephites, they took Nephite women and children as prisoners, and these they sacrificed to their pagan gods. It seems probable that Mormon's people, who themselves delight in bloodshed, whose wickedness could not be described, were angry that Nephite bodies were being sacrificed. Rather than being repulsed by Lamanite human sacrifice, it was also a sad commentary that even given the abominable Lamanite practice of human sacrifice to pagan gods and other atrocities, Cities, Mormon admits that the Lamanites were still no more wicked than some of his own people. Chapter 5, Mormon 5. 
Mormon 5 verse 2, Mormon once again takes command of the Nephite army. For the Nephites, it was their last hope, but Mormon was without hope for them. Not only could Mormon see that their efforts were fut futile, but also he was well aware of the prophecies as to the final fate of this people. Their destruction was sure because of their failure to repent and trying to struggle for their lives without turning to God. Mormon and his records stand as witness to their downfall. Chapter 5, verse 8. The war between the Nephites and the Lamanites was so destructive that Mormon hated to relate the awful scene of carnage and bloodshed that occurred among the people. His statement that all things must be revealed has a dual meaning. Several scripture passages testify that the judgment, all deeds, words, thoughts, and intents of the heart, both righteous and wicked, will be revealed, will be shouted from the housetops, as it were, for all to know. Undoubtedly, Mormon had this doctrinal concept in mind as he spoke of the wickedness of his own civilization. But examining the context of this statement leads one to believe that Mormon may also be referring to another, more specific way in which the full, fuller record of the Nephites would be revealed. In the next verse, several verses we read of the knowledge of his people that will come forth because of his record. Throughout his record, Mormon speaks of other records or acts accounts, even another set of plays that contain additional information and a more historical or a more history part of the people. Being familiar with the prophecies of the holy men who had preceded him, Mormon was probably also referring to the coming forth of those records that were sealed. As this record, which is sealed by the power of God, comes to light in the last days, all the workings of God will be revealed, and the deeds and destruction of the Nephites and the Lamanites, which Mormon could not describe, will indeed be revealed upon the housetops. Chapter 5, verses 9-13 through 13. It is Mormon's intent that the knowledge of these things, as contained in his small abridgment, which we have in the Book of Mormon, should come forth to the remnant of the seed of Lehi, so that they could know whereby the blessings of the Lord could be obtained. It was also his hope that the sorrow that would come to his remnant, as they learned of the destruction of their ancestors, would lead them to repent and the mercies of, and the mercies of Jesus. To the Gentiles who would bring forth this record and minister to the remnants of Lehi's people, Mormon also wrote desiring that his record would also benefit and bless them. Mormon had complete confidence that the Lord would preserve his abridgment and bring it forth in the Lord's own due time by his own righteous means to achieve his own purposes. Chapter 5 verse 16 the Spirit of the Lord had now ceased to strive with the people, being without Christ and God in the world, and driven about as chaff before the wind. President Harold B. Lee explained that the wicked people of Mormon's time had lost not only the Holy Ghost, but the Spirit of Christ from their lives. Quote, Mormon described some people, his people, from whom the Spirit of the Lord had departed. And I, when, when I read that, it seems clear to me that what he was talking about was not merely the inability to have the companionship of or the gift of the Holy Ghost, but he was talking of that light of truth which everyone born into the world is entitled and will never cease to strive with the individual unless he loses it through his own sinning. When a person has sinned to the point that the light of Christ, the Spirit of God, ceases to strive with him, the spark of the divine that is inherent in every man is gone, and the link to divinity is broken, leaving the person without Christ and God in their lives. If the light of Christ was persuades men to do good, to believe in Christ, and to know good from evil is taken away due to wickedness, that person becomes chaff, blown in any direction by the tempest of Satan. Boy, such was the condition of these people. Chapter 5, verse 18, the people have become so wicked that they are led about by Satan like chaff in the wind, or as a vessel tossed upon the waters. Chapter 5, verse 23, know ye not that ye are in the hands of God? Mormon wrote for us in the latter days, wanting us to recognize God and his power. We are in his hands. Elder W. Craig Zwick of the Seventy explained some symbolism and blessings suggested by being in God's hands. Quote, hands are one of the symbolic expressive parts of the body. In Hebrew, yod, the most common word for hand, is also used metaphorically to mean power, strength, and might. 
Thus, hands signify power and strength. To be in the hands of God would suggest that we are not only under his watchful care, but also that we are guarded and protected by his wondrous power. Throughout the scriptures, reference is made to the hand of the Lord. His divine assistance is evidence over and over again. His powerful hands created worlds, and yet they were gentle enough to bless little children. Every one of us needs to know that we can go in the strength of the Lord. We can put our hand in His, and we will feel His sustaining presence lift us to heights unattainable alone. How do we learn to extend and connect to the comfort provided by the Lord? Here are four keys. Learn, listen, seek the Spirit, pray always. The Lord will provide sustenance and support if we are willing to open the door and receive his hand of divine assistance. Imagine the wounds in his hands, his weathered hands, yes, even his hands of torn flesh and physical sacrifice give our own hands greater power and direction. It is the one it is the wounded Christ who leads us through our moments of difficulty. It is he who bears us up when we need more air to breathe or direction to follow or even more courage to continue. If we will keep the commandments of God and walk hand in hand with him in his paths, we will go forward with faith and never feel alone. End of quote. Unfortunately, the Nephites and Lamanites had lost the right to this blessing of being directed by the Lord and were left to the designs of Satan. Mormon chapter 6. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. The war continues between the Lamanites and the Nephites. Mormon realizes that this will be the destruction of his people. Describing the final scenes of the battle between the Nephites and the Lamanites, Mormon writes of the gathering at the land of Cumorah and his preserving the record and hiding them up in the hill of Cumorah and delivering certain plates to his son Moroni. Chapter 6, verse 7, that awful fear of death which fills the breast of all the wicked. The Spirit of the Lord that fills the hearts of the righteous brings comfort, peace, and hope of a glorified resurrection to those who face death. Those that die in me, declared the Lord, shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. In contrast, the wicked have no such hope of peace, and as a result, face the prospects of death with trepidation, unease, even fear. It is for this reason that the Lord in his dispensation urges us to weep for the loss of them that die, and more especially for those that have no hope of a glorious resurrection, and they that die not in me, for woe unto them their death. Is bitter. Chapter 6 verse 8, because of the loss of hope among the people, they were filled with terror because of the numbers of the Lamanites. I can't imagine the thoughts that were going through as these people are watching themselves being slaughtered day after day after day, knowing that their turn will come soon to be killed and destroyed. Chapter 6 verse 10 through 15, Mormon witnesses tens of thousands of his people slaughtered by the Lamanites, except for 24 that remained. Chapter 6, verses 16 through 22, My soul was rent with anguish because of the slain of my people. There is perhaps no more poignant passage in all of Holy Writ than these verses penned by Mormon, in anguish of soul at seeing his nation end in such a wretched state of wickedness after a lifetime of watching them go steadily from bad to worse and being unable to persuade them to repent. One would have to experience such a life in order to fully imagine the feelings that welled in Mormon's heart as he looked upon the thousands of decaying bodies. How is it that you could have fallen, is Mormon's question. It was not a question of military might or lack of it. He was soberly searching for the cause of their willful rebellion against God and their unwillingness to accept the atonement of Christ. Mormon's heart-strict cry, Oh, that ye had repented before this great destruction, is something that modern society also could take as a plea. A plea for us to learn from the pitiful plight of the Nephites by hearkening to the Savior's merciful invitation and thereby preparing to stand righteously before the judgment seat of Christ. 
we too must prepare ourselves to stand before the Lord at the judgment. President James E. Faust explained, quote, We long for the... I'm sorry, this was repeated. We long for the ultimate blessings of the atonement, to become one with him, to be in his divine presence, to be called individually by his name as he warmly welcomes us home with a radiant smile, beckoning us with open arms to be enfolded in his boundless love. How glorious, sublime his experience will be if we can feel worthy enough to be in his presence. The free gift of his great atoning sacrifice for us is the only way we can be exalted enough to stand before him and see him face to face. The overwhelming message of the atonement is the perfect love the Savior has for each and all of us. It is the love which is full of mercy, patience, grace, equity, long-suffering, and above all, forgiving. The evil influence of Satan would destroy any hope we have in overcoming our mistakes. He would have us feel that we are lost and that there is no hope. In contrast, Jesus reaches down to us to lift us up. Through our repentance and gift of the atonement, we can prepare to be worthy to stand in his presence. It would be an understatement to say how faithful Mormon remained while being surrounded by such evil, wickedness, and the denial of God and his blessings. These chapters, Mormons 1 through 6, show that regardless of the situation we find ourselves in, we are still free and able to choose God and eternal life. We can either use our agency to shape our environment and if and its effect upon us, that should be and its and its effects upon us, or let our environment influence us in our decisions. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man, and they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great meteor of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil, for he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. Brothers and sisters, we live in a time of such wickedness and willful rebellion against God and his commandments, but yet we are still free to choose righteousness over wickedness, even in a wicked world. May we have the sense to choose eternal life and to choose Christ. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped with some of the doctrines and principles in these chapters. If it did, please hit the like button.